Hello everyone, my name is Jen and welcome to The Book Refuge. Hello friends. I first off, of course, would like to apologize for the nasal quality of my voice. <laughs> I'm feeling so much better than I was around Thanksgiving, but it's still holding on in here, but the show must go on. So pardon me if uh, that is affecting your viewing experience, your listening experience, but it'll be on soon, okay? It's on its way out. But today we are going over my November favorites and stats. Um, I asked in a previous video if you guys still wanted me to share my stats with you guys. And I mean, well, it's not like it was a whole majority. There was five or six of you that personally messaged me to say keep doing it. But because I take the time to do it and I am a nerd and I'm going to do my stats, whether I share them with you or not, I'll continue to share them. Um, also because in this video I only talk about my five to six favorite books of the month. Um, every book that I read does get talked about. You can check out my playlist for my weekly wrap-ups, which we're getting close to the end. Oh my gosh, I actually have the last three years worth of weekly wrap-ups, which, you know, is over 1,500 books. So you're bound to find something that you love in there. So let's dive right in. I read some absolutely wonderful books, including a new one that just right near the end of the year here managed to fit itself into my favorites, which makes me so happy. So let's get started. All right. So my stats for this month, I read 47 books and they were some big ones, y'all. They were some big books that I got through this month. I binged quite a few series and so I only read two more books than last month, but I read 4,000 more pages. That's how big these books were. So I read 17,743 pages. Particularly one series, the books were huge. And there was a fan fiction I read that was ginormous. <laughs> it was a thousand of those pages of all. The formats of these books were, there was 27 ebooks, 11 physical books, 11 audiobooks, and 8 arcs. The ratings of these books were I had one six star, I had 11 five stars, seven 4.5 stars, 19 four stars, four 3.5 stars, three three stars, and then one two and a half and one two star. So yeah, I was definitely angry at a couple books that I read this month. The subgenres of these books were very interesting, very different from the previous month. It's so funny how that happens, like totally opposite here. So I had eight contemporaries, 10 fantasy, 14 dark, four fan fictions, woohoo, five science fiction, two historical, one paranormal, and one erotic. Oh, I forgot to list my top tropes this month. Let me see. I bet I have the thing still up on my computer here. Forgot to uh, do that. So the top tropes were um, enemies to lovers, forced proximity, um, lots of BDSM that's always there, virgin romance. So basically the same as the last ones. I basically read the same tropes every, uh, every month. So that's no surprise. So yeah, those are the stats. So let's get into the favorites. Um, as always, I have my beautiful book journal. Um, I just love doing this every month. So the first five star read that I had to share about was a part of a binge. So I had a couple binge this month um, and they both came from books that were recommendations. Um, the first one was on my 12 recs from 12 friends, which I'm very proud. I probably won't be getting through any more of those, but I got through, I think nine out of the 12 and I DNF'd one of them. So I'm pretty proud with how that worked out, particularly because some of the books, I just had no like desire to try them at all. And I ended up really liking some. That's why I do challenges like that. Um, and then the other one was one that I've seen so many people read and I had like bought myself a copy to finally make myself read it. So anyway, distractions. So this one that was on my 12 recs for 12 friends was When She Unravels by Gabrielle Sands. And I love this. I already have the last book in this. Well, I don't know if it'll be the last one, but the 
fourth book in the series comes out in December and I can't wait to read it. Um, but I'm glad that I waited till more near the end of the year for this because back when When She Unravels came out, I think only like that book was out and now there's three of them out and there's one more coming soon. So you know how I like to binge the series, so I'm glad I waited. But this one is a mafia romance with a hidden identity. There's kind of a captor captive and of course it's a dark romance factor in this one. So in this we have our heroine Valentina who is married to a horrible man. She was forced into it. Um, her father is a mafia boss. I think in, I think it's New York, but for sure it's in the States. I think it's New York. Um, and at the beginning of this book, we discover how abusive this marriage is. And it's abusive in a very specific way. Um, her husband is an enforcer and he also is a punisher for her father's mafia. And he likes to play with his prey. So sometimes he's supposed to torture them because that's his job, you know, that happens in the mafia. And sometimes he does it because he's a sick fuck, okay? And he has started making Valentina help him. So this isn't a marriage of like really sexual abuse, like besides consummating their marriage, he doesn't continually force her that way. In some respects, I think it might even be worse. At least Valentina would feel like it's even worse, right? Because in some ways she expected to be sleeping with her husband. What she didn't expect is her husband forcing her to help torture and kill the men that he takes. So she has been forced to help him kill these men or else he's going to hurt her sisters and stuff like that, I guess. But then one day, um, he brings in a girl, um, uh, like a teenager, and she's supposed to help torture this, and Valentina draws the line. So she actually shoots her husband and helps this girl escape, and they go on the run. She gives the girl some money, and she's like, best luck to you, get out of the country, and I'm going to go a different way. So she leaves, and she ends up in a foreign country and gets her, the rest of her money stolen because she doesn't know what she's doing. And she ends up asking, like, getting a job at a dance club, not as a dancer, but as a maid there. Because she wouldn't know how to dance or do any of that, but she needs a job. And so she gets a job there. And the owner of this club, he's trying to, like, scare her away from it. She actually kind of challenges him into giving her a job. And so he agrees to give her this job, but he's gonna, he's doing it for a trial basis. And he's gonna try to scare her out of it. Like, that's what he's trying to do. He's trying to intimidate her out of it. But he finds he really likes her spark. He likes her sass and he has a bit of trouble doing that actually. So as things progress for them, I don't want to spoil the whole book, but I've already shared this a few times. He eventually finds out her identity and finds out she's from a mafia family and he finds out in a very shocking and not a great way. We'll just say that. And uh, that then leads into the captor captive aspect of this because once he finds out who she is and what she's accused of doing, he wants some revenge for it. But it ends up starting our series and like I said, I binged the other two. I read these three in like 48 hours. I couldn't stop reading. Um, and I gave this one five stars and I gave the third one five stars. The second one I gave four and a half. I, they were all really good. And again, the next one comes out soon. So yeah, this one, it was four on the spice scale for me. There was some rough sex going on. There was also, like I said, some torture mentioned. Um, and there was an abusive marriage. So be prepared for that if you read it. All right, then the next one I want to talk about is the one that I also binged five books in the series. And they were some big ones. And this was one that I have seen around. I saw when it was really big on TikTok, like last year maybe. This is a fantasy romance um, that involves a um, Dust Walker. This is the Dust Walker Bride series. And A Soul to Keep is about Orpheus and Rhea. So Rhea is considered a ill omen because her family was murdered in a demon attack. She lives in this world where demons are all around and if humans don't have protection from the demons they're gonna get crunched by them basically and so Rhea's village has a special protection um Orpheus comes every 10 years and does a spell that protects their town and in exchange the people give him a willing bride basically although 
they don't call it a bride. They like call it a sacrifice or whatever. He calls it a bride because that's what he's looking for. He's looking for a bride. Now, there's a lot of intricacies about what a dust walker is and how they become who they are and like what their powers are. And like, that's a whole stuff I can't explain in this. But that's also the stuff that I found to be fascinating. And it's also the stuff that people didn't fully explain when they're talking about it because it's just so much, okay? But Rhea isn't necessarily willing, but even though when Orpheus asks her, like, are you willing, she's like, fine, I'll go. Because if she doesn't go willingly, her people are going to torture and kill her because this is all that she's good for in their eyes is to be a sacrifice to him because she's an ill omen and they don't like her and they want her to be gone. So she agrees to go with the plan that she's going to try to escape. But she goes with him, like, through the veil, which, you know, is where, like, all the demons and them live. And he has a cabin that he's built, this home he's made, and it does have some protections from the demons. But here's the thing, he also is a danger to her because dust walkers are still partially like demon in some way. And that means that fear and blood hunger them, like make them hungry. And if she is ever gets too afraid of him or she bleeds in front of him, that will like, he'll lose his mind and attack and it won't matter whether he doesn't want to hurt her or not. And Rhea actually finds out that this is his, she's his like 19th person that he's brought here. It isn't just women. There's been some men too. And he's always searching for someone who will be his companion and won't be afraid of him and won't like release his rage where like he ends up killing them. You know, like he feels horrible when he does that, but he can't control it. So that becomes our dance between the two of them is he's made this home for her. He wants her to be happy there, wants her to want to be there with him, and she wants to get away because she never really wanted to be there. So it's this back and forth between them. And I found the lore of the Dust Walkers and like the overarching story of this series so fascinating. And that's why I ended up like I binged all five of them that are out already. So A Soul to Keep is the one that I gave five stars and it is my favorite that I read. Um, that's why I'm sharing this one. Um, but I liked them all quite a bit. I really did. So I gave book two 4.5 stars. I gave book three 4.5 stars. I gave book four 4 stars and book five 4 stars. So you can check out my weekly wrap-ups as I said, the one where I read all of these and I go in more depth about all of them. But I do really recommend them. I I couldn't like hardly do anything else except read those until I was done with it. Okay. Then we have one that I mean is, I, I mean, I knew it's controversial. It, no one can doubt that it's popular, but you know, for some people, they just think this series is like, they don't get it. And I understand cause I've been part of that before, but for me, I get it and I fucking loved it. So we have Iron Flame, um, which I of course read the day that it came out. I grabbed the audiobook just like I had with Fourth Wing. This time I was a bit more nervous to read this where when I read Fourth Wing, I had no idea what I was getting into. Literally nothing. I heard dragons and I knew that a bunch of my friends were going to be reading it and I read it, right? We talked about that before. And with Iron Flame, I was really nervous to see where things were going and to see what she would build upon. Now, I'm an enjoyment reader, and I love the audiobooks, and I love dragons, and I love Zayden, and I loved the stuff we got into with this. Does it all perfectly make sense? Is it all like, you know, is Violet still really whiny about some certain stuff? Is she giving Zayden a harder time than she should for what we go in? Are we kind of jumping from thing to thing sometimes? Yes, we are. And I will be the first person to tell you that I don't necessarily think this series has the strongest, like, foundation and backbone, okay? But to me, this type of story is absolutely crack because, as I said, it's dragons, it's magic, it's a good romance, and it's spicy, okay? It's there. It still reads kind of new adult, even childish sometimes, even though there's sexy stuff in here. Um, and I know that it's going to be difficult to sustain a relationship over, there's supposed to be five books in this. If we continue to just have Violet as the main POV, that's going to be difficult. Um, I'm not doing a full, like, breakdown of this again. There's a 30 minute review in the week that I talked about this one. Um, I think that she really starts to, needs to start adding other POVs in here and stop teasing people with there being two POVs. 
the fucking audiobook saying like it's Rebecca Soler with Teddy Hamilton when he only has one chapter. I was really hoping that we were going to have more dual POV in here, especially because after the first book, once we know so many of his secrets, like I know there's still stuff we don't know that there are reveals about Zayden that still happen in this book, but a good author would be able, and I'm not calling her a bad author, but a clever author would know how to do an unreliable narrator and would be able to give us Zayden without giving away the whole game. You know what I mean? Like there are ways to do that. Because I think that it does get tough being in Violet's head all the time. Only her head. Um, she can be a frustrating girl. So I, yeah. But anyway, you can watch other people people's reviews for, you know, things you don't like about it. I still had a fun time. And for me, that means this was still five stars. I didn't give this one six stars because Fourth Wing still like wowed me so much. I had fun with that, even though there are aspects of this one I liked better. I liked some of the reveals in this one. I liked the action in this one. Jeez, the battle scenes are still intense. I loved more steam in this one. And I loved the dragons even more. Like some of the revelations about the dragons in here. I'm here for it. And we have no idea when book three of this one is coming. Like it appears that like Fourth Wing and Iron Flame were probably, you know, like this one was probably almost done. In fact, it probably was done when Fourth Wing came out just because of how quick the turnaround was for this one. So who knows when we'll be getting the third one or what's going on. And yes, we're left with a cliffhanger. Although with this one, some people I think are taking this cliffhanger way over the top. I said that in my review. Like, I don't know. I'm not scared about what that revelation was at all because this is a romance series. And yeah, she's probably going to torture us for a few books. That's what happens, you know? But I'm not like worried about what it means for Zayden and uh, Violet. I'm just not because this is romance author. And that's the thing I love about romance. I know that I'm going to be safe even if I have to suffer on the way there. So yeah, gave that one five stars. <clears throat> All right, next up, I actually, both the next two books are books that are not out yet, but I want you to go pre-order them when I'm done talking about them, okay? Go pre-order them if you can, if you have the funds to do so, because I want you to support these authors and love their books like I do, okay? This one is a Highlander Scottish historical romance, and I've been wanting to read more historical romance. This month, I didn't do too great with that because I was lost in the fantasy land for sure. And I read a lot of mafia. That's why I read 14 dark romances this month. There was a lot of mafia. But I read an upcoming release called Hold Fast by Eliza MacArthur. This book comes out on the 7th of December. So it's not too long. You know, it's only like, uh, I think it's only a week away from when you're seeing this video. Um, and this, so Eliza MacArthur, MacArthur is the author who wrote Soft Flannel Hank, which I finally just read like last month, I read Soft Flannel Hank and I enjoyed it so much and I've been talking about it a lot and she has more books coming in that series next year, but she also loves historical romance and this book she says is like a love letter to Julie Garwood. So if you love Julie Garwood, I think you will like this. There's a lot of similarities, but if you don't love Julie Garwood or you got frustrated with how some of those stories go, I think you can still find a home in this one because it does still have some more like modernish historical parts to it. It isn't just like a Highlander romance, but I particularly felt how I felt reading some Highlander romances from Julie Garwood. So anyway, Hold Fast is about Una and Eowyn, Owen, Ian, I'm probably saying it wrong, whatever, but it's a Scottish name. And we come across Una when she is just getting out of a hand fast with a horrible man. Um, he is a, I think it's the Camerons is who she was with. Sorry, I didn't put that in my notes, but either way, she's been with him for a year and a day. Her father had basically given her in this hand fast and she was a healer. Um, that's what she loves to do. And she gets given to this man and for a hand fast. Now, the thing with a hand fast, though, if you, if you don't know that it is basically kind of a trial marriage for a year and a day. And at the end of that year and the day, the, they can decide to separate and there's not supposed to be any recriminations. It doesn't matter that now she's not pure anymore or it's not supposed to anyway, right? 
Um, and no one can force you to stay in that. Like no one can, like, even if it was like forced that you started, like no one's supposed to be able to force you to stay because you get to decide to go. And so Una, she is ready to go. It's finally time. And she gets out of there. Now there is still someone there who she does care about, which I won't like spoil that, but there is a friend that she has. There's a few other people who like her too, but a lot of them carry a lot of shame because they know that she's basically just been raped and brutalized by the Cameron for a year and a day. She's beautiful. She is, you know, smart and kind. And he just took all that and just tried to use it all up. Um, she was able to like prevent pregnancy with him because if she had had a baby with him, she would have had to leave the baby there or she wouldn't have been able to go. So she did make sure she prevented pregnancy with him. Um, so she is on her way. She is leaving, getting out of there and she's going to go to, um, I can't remember where she's planning to go, but she has a, uh, connection that she made in another keep where she helped with the birth of a baby over there. And that mistress there had offered, if you'd ever like to come and be our healer or be with us, like we would love to have you if you can. So that's where she's planning to go. Then we switch over to Ewan. Ewan, I never know how to pronounce this. I'm so sorry if you know it, but it's E-W-A-N. I never know how to say it. I think it's Ewan, but I'm not sure. I know it's... Anyway, and he is the Laird of the McDonald's, and he is the oldest. I think there are five, six siblings, and some of them are half-siblings, and he saw how love kind of ruined his father, so... His mother died birthing their youngest sister, and the father was still a good father to all of them. But he basically just hung around until they were old enough to take care of themselves, but his spirit was really gone. He never made his kids feel unloved because of it, but he always wanted to be with his wife. And so Ewan has kind of set in his mind that he doesn't want to fall in love like that because it hurts so much to see. So that's the kind of, you know, situation we have for that. But he is not like a hardened man by any means and he loves his siblings. And so um, <coughs> he's out with his siblings when one of his younger brothers gets badly injured and they get him back to the keep, but they know that he needs a healer really badly. So Ewan saddles up his horse and he's going to go try to find a healer. And he happens to come across Una um, while well, she's like walking on her way somewhere and they, he's like, you know, do you know where there's a healer nearby, blah, blah, blah. And she ends up being like, well, it just so happens that I'm a healer. And he's like, oh my God, you are? Okay, please come back with me. And she's like, I don't know who you are. I don't really want to go with you. Are you going to let me leave? You know, because healers are a big commodity. And if his keep doesn't have one, she knows that he might want to keep her. And he's like, please come with me. After you heal my brother, I'll take you wherever you want to go, blah, 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 blah. So she's like, okay. So she goes with and she helps save his brother. She also is like, if I can't save him, are you going to punish me? You know, that would be a horrible thing to be a healer and just be like punished for not being able to save someone, you know? Um, and he, Ewan is like, no, I mean, he's dead if you can't help him. Because in the day or two it's taken to get her back, his brother has an infection and it's not going well. Um, so he is able to help her. After things are looking better for his brother, Ewan does offer to have her stay. Um, and he's like, you could be our healer here. We'll get you a home here. And if at any time you decide you want to leave, I will take you to the place that you wanted to go to. I'll take you to that keep. So you're safe. But he's like, but we don't have a healer at all. And like, they do have one. Um, cause there's a healer there that already. Um, so she's like, okay, now the thing that trips it up and really gets this going is that her father finds out that she's at the McDonald's and her father we're very frustrated with him. He's the one who had given her to the Camerons and he's like, I'm going to take my daughter. You can't have her here unless you're going to marry her and pay for her, which is just so shit because she's already went through what her dad made her. And she's like, I don't care what my reputation is. I want to be a healer. I'm not going to be forced to marry someone. And her father's like, Nope, can't stay here. It'll ruin her reputation. It's shit. And so Ewan is desperate to keep her. And he also kind of does like her. He thinks she's kind of feisty. So he's, he offers to marry her, even though he never planned to marry. He, he's like, this could be good, but she doesn't want to be forced into a marriage again. So 
this time she offers a hand fast. She's like, let's do a hand fast. And he's like, but I'm pretty sure I want to marry you. Like, I think we could suit. I, you know, I don't want you to feel like I don't want you. She's like, no, no, no. This is what I want. She's like, I never have gotten to choose. I don't want to be locked into it because I've seen how. It... So he's like, okay, but I'm going to ask you to marry me every day. And at any time you can end this hand fast and we can get married, you know? So then it begins her, their year and a day of her being hand fast to him. So this, this book was so beautiful. I, I had the best time with this. As I said, it felt like an old school Scottish historical, but it had such great, like, dialogue and characters and you know she sets up the background characters very well like they're set up for the next couple it felt dangerous like we were scared of the Camerons like if they found out where she was like that guy is very vengeful um but also watching these two fall in love was so beautiful and like Ewan like he never wanted to marry but it's not really from this like hardened place. It's from a place of like, he saw how much pain it caused his father to lose his mother. It's that kind of thing. You know, it's kind of like the Anthony Bridgerton thing. You know, like you saw how much your parents suffered from losing their love. Doesn't mean that that love wasn't amazing. It just meant that he saw the pain of it and he doesn't want to feel that. But once he sees Una and starts getting to know her, he's like, I think I kind of get it. Like, I think I kind of get why you'd be willing to risk it. So I thought these two were so beautiful together. This was so swoony. And again, if you love historicals, or maybe you're one, like, this could be a great opportunity to try a Scottish historical if you haven't. Because it is still a very approachable story. It was very easy to get into. Where some of those older ones, they can be hard to get into for some people. That's what intimidates a lot of people. It even has the great, like, cover on it that makes it look like it's from the 90s. And yeah, this is a small author that I want you to support. This is only her second book, I believe. Um, so please give this a try. Go ahead and pre-order it. It comes out on the 7th, and I think you'll really like it. All right. And now, as promised, we get to a new favorite. It's already been added to my six-star page. Um, in, my, in my top reads, I have my all the books that I'll be rereading and rating for my top books of the year. And this one, of course, had to be on there. This one comes out on the 14th, so it's two weeks away, and it is P.S. You're Intolerable by Julia Wolf. So it's no surprise that I like Julia Wolf. I have read the last about 10 books that have come out from her. I'm a part of her ARC team. And she just writes these heroes that get so far gone for their heroines. Some of them are in a dark romance setting more, you know, like her new adult ones are a bit like darker type story. They have some dubious consent in those ones. But her adult books are kind of the opposite of that. They are not opposite. They are fully consensual, like over the top. The man is completely gone for the woman. There's enthusiastic consent. Like that's what we're at with those. Okay. And I enjoyed Dear Grumpy Boss. It was okay. I really liked um, uh, your, what is it? Sincerely, I always forget that one. Sincerely, your, inconsider your inconsiderate wife, your inconvenient wife. Ugh, the titles. Um, but I just, I was excited for Elliot's book. Elliot is the brother of the heroine from the first one. And it's these three friends. They each own a company and they're billionaires. So it's a billionaire series. And the women are usually like either like their secretary or work for them in some way. Um, and that's kind of how that goes. So in this one, we get introduced to Catherine. And Catherine at the beginning of this book is nine weeks pregnant. She is pregnant by a friend of hers who they had a night of celebration when they signed um, the sale for this property, for this home that they bought, that they're going to flip together. Um, but this friend is kind of a fair weather friend. He's a bit of a scammer, which is funny because he's from an extremely wealthy family in Australia. And he's there with her and they buy this house and then 
he ends up, um, as we'll see very soon, like ditching her. Um, he's planning to be involved in the baby's life. He says he will, but again, he fades away very quickly. So at the beginning of this book, they have just bought this house together. They're supposed to be working on flipping it. She's sunk all the money she had left in it. Um, and so now she needs a job to kind of like help sustain her while they're doing this renovation. And so she gets hired at Levi Holdings or yeah, Levi Levy Holdings, I think is what it's called or Levy Development. I don't know, whatever. It's, it's a business and Levi or uh, Elliot Levy owns it. And he, she runs into him at like leaving a coffee shop in the morning and gets coffee all over herself. He bumps her and he's actually the person she's supposed to be having an interview with for a secretary. So supposedly we'll say that. And he's like, well, if you can get yourself cleaned up and be up there in time, uh, I'll be happy to interview you. So he gives her kind of this challenge of like, make yourself presentable, which is a bit frustrating. Cause you're like, dude, you're like ran into me and like spilled this. So she does, she finds a way to, uh, uh, jigger up an outfit and goes and has this interview and he hires her to be his executive assistant. And now we start kind of having a few like little time jumps that we have. Um, soon enough, her friend has to go back to Australia. He says he'll be coming back, but he leaves her in this kind of dump of a house. And then eventually we find out too that he didn't pay the contractors the rest of what they owe. And so when that contractor leaves, he takes back all the work that he had done that wasn't like paid for yet. Um, and so she basically only has her room and the baby's room and a working like bathroom in this house. So it's not a super safe place to be living either. But anyway, that's kind of happening in the background. So working for Elliot's really tough. He's very strict. He has these weird quirks and she's starting to get to know them. And she secretly is like super annoyed with him, but it's a great job to have. And working for Elliot, like she knows it's a good position. So she puts up with a lot of it. And we start to see these tiny little things though that he does to, uh, look out for her. And one of the first things is that she comes into work and there's someone replacing her chair and the whole floor got new chairs. Um, and like her chair was super uncomfortable. And one of the fellow like secretaries for a different office is like, you know, that he did this so you could have a new chair. Right. And she's like, what? No, everybody needs new chairs. And he's like, no, I've seen him see how uncomfortable you are getting out of your chair every day. He did this for you. So she's like, whatever. So Elliot doesn't realize she's pregnant for the first like five months that she's there. Um, so Catherine is a curvy girl plus size. So she isn't even really showing for quite a while either. And you know, he should never have like asked if she was pregnant anyway. So it's not his fault. And also you don't have to tell your boss that you're pregnant. Um, you know, when you're getting hired because they're not allowed to use that as a reason. Right. And so it's one of his friends that like clues him in that like, you know, she's expecting soon. Like, is she going to find a replacement for her while you're gone? And so Elliot's like, what? She's pregnant. And so then he starts like wanting to make her life easier. And so he does all these little things to care for her where he, you know, he's like, well, I don't want you to be gone, but who's going to be your replacement while you're gone? And he starts like bringing her coffee for her and giving her time to drink her coffee like before they have their meeting so that she can get ready for him. He sets up a nursing room on their floor. There's one on the first floor, but he's like, well, I want you to be comfortable. And this one's a private one. So he sets up a private nursing room for her. And then he gives her a gift card so she can get a massage. And then she's talking with her friends and she's like, this was really sweet of him as a gift. But like, I don't need a massage. I need things for my baby. And like, she's like, just kind of complaining to her friends of like, and he overhears her and she's so embarrassed. Cause she's like, I was just bitching. I didn't mean that I wasn't grateful. And so when she gets back from lunch, he's left her a gift card for like a baby website. And he's like, I'm sorry. I didn't think that through. So she's just like, damn it. Why is he being so nice? And like all these things. So I know I'm talking a lot about this one, but it's a favorite book. And I have to tell you, so I just, I adored all of those things. And this is a really like slow burn in this one. Okay. Like we don't rush into anything. Elliot very much like 
hides his cards about how he's thinking about her like she's his employee he's not going to cross any lines with that he doesn't want her to be uncomfortable but then she's had her baby and he has his substitute assistant while she's on maternity leave and he gives this guy a horrible time they call him like shaky chad or something i don't even remember his name because he shakes like a leaf whenever elliot like barks at him or whatever and so it's been like six, seven weeks and he like wants to find out when Catherine's coming back. So he goes to her house to like find out when she's coming back. And also he needs a like document that his assist, his temp assistant is finding. And he shows up at her house and she's just so embarrassed that he shows up because the house isn't safe. Like it isn't safe. It isn't finished. And like when he's there, she goes upstairs to get him this document and like she stubs her toe and starts like bleeding horribly. And, um, she comes down and he's like holding the baby cause she was fussing and he's just in his fancy suit, just holding the baby. And so we're all just like die and swoon for it. And he's gonna leave. And he's like, I can't leave you here. Like, this isn't safe. Come stay with me till you can finish this house. I have a house with so many guest rooms. Come stay with me. And so that's the second phase of this book is now she is like rooming with him and we get to see him just gushing over this baby all the time and this billionaire just completely falling in love with this little baby girl. And of course, as we watch him fall in love with the baby girl, we watch Catherine fall head over heels for him because who wouldn't fall in love with this man who just wants to take care of you and take care of your baby and we watch Elliot become a father to this little girl and it was so beautiful it was so beautiful you guys and this romance is a slow burn between these two it really is because she doesn't think like really any nice things about him she thinks he's annoying it's a job like she is just like frustrated about him and things like that like we get with a boss but Elliot knows that he's difficult but he also has such a tender kind side and watching him do that you will fall completely in love with him before we ever get to the sexy stuff and boy there's some sexy stuff okay so I've talked enough about this one I hope you've already pre-ordered it after I've talked about it but it will be on KU the day it comes out as well but as to the spicy side, we'll just talk about a little of that because, again, this one does not rush into anything by any means. Um, it's also not like an excruciating slow burn, but we take our time with it. Of course, when she's living with him, it kind of accelerates things. But we have some great um, breast play happening since she's a new mom and there's some uh, milk uh, expression that happens. I know that's not everybody's thing, but like I think it's super hot. So I love it. And then there is also like some breeding kink later on too. There's a couple times where he's like, I'm going to put another baby in you. And this time I'm going to be here for everything. Like I'm dead for that stuff. Okay. Just like deceased in my review of this. I said, I am dead for Eli Levy and you are looking at my corpse right now. Like I was just, I'm super into it. So that is a new favorite and it's going to be in my top 10. Like it's absolutely going to be because it has everything that I want. And it also took its time in such a beautiful way. So highly recommend so much. And I think you'll find a theme in my end of the year favorites because I think I have three or four books that are single moms who like the man falls for her and the child. Like I just love that stuff. So there we go. So anyway, those are my top reads of November. Let me know what yours were. Please, uh, I have links to my favorites down below. Check those out. If you want to know about all the 47 books I read, check out my weekly wrap-ups for more details there. And make sure you're subscribed to the channel and like this video. It really helps the algorithm and also helps you know when I post. Thanks so much for watching, friends, and I'll see you next time.